so yeah, so as Josh just said, I'm going to be talking about this in a different category of grammar, like see, trying to see that as a framework for uh, studying the dynamics of semantic change. Um, I remember Juan as our grad student here. Okay, so the question I'm, I'm trying to investigate here, the question I'm thinking about is, uh, how does pragmatic, expressive, or use conditional meaning uh, become conventionalized over time? And I'm going to argue that we need to think about two components for that. One of them, um, I think we need a more or less uh, a persistent representation of linguistic episodes, which departs from the traditional uh, from the traditional linguistics of thinking about redundancy-free categories. And we also need a radically lexicalist theory of grammatical elements to go with that. Okay, so I'm going to be talk about one uh, case of competition in the, in the morphology of Portuguese that I think fits well with this definition of subjectification that Draga uh, brought. Uh, seeing that as the development of a grammatically identifiable expression of speaker belief or speaker attitude to what is said. Uh, Trauma exemplifies that, well, like uh, with many cases, but one of them is the development of uh, epistemic modos in English. So you have, you have, you must be careful, be very careful. Where must started out as a main verb, then developed a beyondic meaning, and Nowadays, it has also like this epistemic meaning that relates to the belief states of the speaker. That's why we talk about subjectification. Okay? Subjectification can also be seen uh, in other shifts in the realm of lexical change that are not so much involved with grammaticalization. So we have the like English speakers have this change from "boor," uh, which initially denoted a countryman or a farmer, and then that, like, it seems that this inference that, well, farmers are going to refine, uh, became conventionalized, and then more means a crude person. This can also, subject, subjectification can also be seen in morphology, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in a moment, uh, and we see that in the development of this Portuguese suffix, isi, which used to be to form abstract nouns, neutral ones, but then ended, ended up developing this uh, pejorative connotation. Okay, the question is how do like, these changes happen? And I think one, 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 one interesting insight in the pragmatic literature, like very early pragmatic literature, literature is this idea by guys in Swiki that, well, it seems that some, it seems to be the case that some invited inferences can historically become part of, of a semantic representation in the strict sense. They exemplify that with the case of since, uh, that uh, which started out as a temporal marker, establishing a temporal relation uh, between two sentences, and because of the temporal, this relation of something happening after the other, that can easily invite the inference that these two events are related. And so since I left home, my mom has been mad at me. Nowadays, it's ambiguous, right? It's like you can uh, refer only to this temporal relation or to the cause uh, of my mom being mad at me. Okay. Um, Okay, so and when, when we think of, usually when we think about this, uh, when we look at this cases of semantic change, we can we can observe uh, discrete stages in the evolution of this of this construction, right? We can we can see a stage where things have a temporal meaning, a stage where it has started having uh, causal meanings too, and a stage where we can have things only with a causal meaning, um, where it have police meaning. Uh, what I'm interested in in this talk is what happens in between these stages? How can we try to model the dynamics of the change from one stage to the other, right? Uh, and I think the first component uh, in the way I'm thinking about this is exemplar theory. Exemplar theory is a theory that comes from the psychology of categorization. Uh, and the basic idea is that people categorize 
novel stimuli by comparing their similarity to previous examples from each relevant category. This is distinct from what we usually think about in linguistics, where we have an abstract category that is kind of redundancy free, to which we, we are going to compare novel stimuli. Okay. As Michael Jones puts it, in this, in this sort of theory, semantic abstraction is an emerging artifact of retrieval from episodic memory. So the, mere, the, the very fact of categorizing an example by uh, a, a stimulus by comparing it to previous examples, that is the abstract uh, uh, event of categorization. Okay, example theory has, has, has received interpretation that all uh, famous levels of Mars, uh, all famous three levels of mathematical modeling in the cognitive sciences. So initially, it was proposed as a computational model, it has received algorithmic implementations, and I'm, and I'm developing one too. And it has also uh, received implementational levels, uh, as in Ashby and Rosedale's model of how an example theory can be, can be implemented in, in the brain. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about a, a, a model of variation that spans all these three levels. Okay, uh, several models have been applied in linguistics before. Uh, there's this, this pioneering work by Johnson uh, using several models to account for uh, variability in speech perception, how we accommodate to different uh, to, to, to different speakers. Uh, it has also been applied in social phonetics. Um, Usually, when when example theory is brought in, 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 is brought up in linguistics circles. Uh, or usually afraid, oh, what happens to linguistic categories now? And, and uh, I think they have, this has to, this is more, I think, has to do more with the sociological fact about how it was introduced in the discipline of linguistics. But uh, the fact that example models would embrace redundancy and concreteness does not entail that we should get rid of linguistic, linguistic categories. And I think there are reasons why we, 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 might, we might really need them. And as a result, Hybrid models have emerged, like, uh, uh, and I think mine is one of them, and I'm going to give at least one reason why we might think of linguistic, linguistic categories. Right? I mean, even if you think of, it, of, of, of an example model that is full of redundancy, uh, we still have to think about how exactly examples are stored in it. And in that, uh, in that process, we might need linguistic categories. Okay, so how does the grammar look like in my, in my theory? Uh, I think ideally the, the grammar model should be radically lexicalist to, to bear well with, with an example model. Uh, meaning that in, in, in the model shouldn't have like a lot of grammar over and above what is encoded in the lexical items, so it should project very directly from the lexical items. And the combinatorial category of grammar is one theory that provides exactly that. Uh, in category grammar, every lex lexical item can, can be seen as a double of a phonological, with phonological representation, a synthetic category, and a semantic type. And importantly, the synthetic category is itself a function specifying an input and an output. And, and the way the synthetic category is built is very directly mapped to the semantic type. So if I retrieve an exemplar of scenes, this example tell me, tells me exactly what I, what I can do with that, with that item. So it basically drives the rest of the derivation without needing the grammar on top of that. So the grammar, in a kind of real sense, emerges from the retrieval of examples. So let's see how, uh, again, in more detail, how this change we observe in the four scenes can be thought about in this theory. So, uh, okay, so as we have since I left home, left home, my mom has been mad at me. And as we discussed, the temporal relation in this case is an advice and inference of causality, which we assume is then associated with, with the memory traces of this address. Right? And, but the memory trace of an address like that is actually distributed uh, among the, the traces, the, the memory traces, and all the, the linguistic items that were used in composing this sentence. So this, like, just an, as an illustration, here I have like, lots of examples that were activated in processing the sentence, I, since I left my mom, and so on, okay? Uh, presumably, these items have 
and will be used to, to, to process other sentences, so they will have lots of other examples of, of these items. Uh, but by virtue of the fact that, by virtue of the, the temporal relation that is encoded in SIMS, it's expected that this item is going to appear you know, in, in many other sentences where the causality inference is going to arise. So this example, like that's why they're, they are more colorful, <laughs> they're going to be, uh, this example is going, this, this category is going to be more associated with a causality inference. Okay. And uh, a strong population of scenes exemplars associated with the inference of, of a causal relation in, in this theory, will entail a high, higher probability that since we'll be recruited for utterances where causality is the focus. Okay? Even, when, even when the temporal relation might not be the focus or might not even be at stake. Okay? And then we have sentences like, since I'm leaving home, my mother is mad at me, where a temporal relation doesn't matter very much. Actually, like, two things are happening at the same time. And the real focus is, is this causality. And by virtue of recruiting examples uh, of scenes that uh, in order to process or to, 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 to perceive or to produce the, the sentence, the speaker is going to, to, to have like new examples of scenes that are associated with the causality inference, with the causality sense, and not necessarily with the temporal sense. And this paves the way to real polysemy when we have examples for the same expression that diverge in me. Okay, now switching to the case study I'm, uh, yeah, I'm actually working on right now, uh, which is the competition between these two Portuguese suffixes, EC and ESA in Israel Portuguese. They both form abstract nouns from nouns and adjectives. The difference is that EC has a more pejorative connotation, so in this uh, branqueza from white, this is more neutral. To, to, talking about the whiteness of, this, of snow, right? Whereas Brankisi has a more pejorative or humorous connotation, talking about, I don't know, things white people do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, both of these substances have been productive in, in the history of Portuguese for a long time. Uh, but the evidence suggests that ESA is the oldest of the two. And the, like one reason for that is that it, it is a regular reflex of Latin Ikea. Uh, this is what we would expect from, some, from regular sound changes. It's also attested in the earliest Galician Portuguese texts. And also, it is, it is attested in, in other Romance languages since the 1200s, so it seems really to have been like a direct reflex from, from the, the Latin subjects. Uh, EC, on the other hand, uh, it's not a regular development. The regular development from the EU would be Eche which has some attestations in the, in the top hundreds, but later was supplanted by, uh, by EC and by other suffixes. Uh, EC is also not attested in the top hundreds, and is absent from neighboring languages. It's, it's a characteristic Portuguese suffix. Uh, the origin of the suffix is still an open question, uh, and it seems to be uh, maybe a borrowing from Old French through gallo romance which makes sense since the Portuguese had a lot of uh, cultural contact with, uh, with uh, gallo romance speakers. Okay. Uh, so the takeaway from that is that, well, EC is a later development from The data source for, for my uh, research is collected from uh, this, the Corpus of, of Portuguese, which is uh, uh, available online. So far, I have annotated 290 words in ESA from the 1200s to the 1400s, and 283 words from the Inici from the 1200s and 1800s, uh, based on an affect scale. I can categorize each word as having a negative affect, a neutral affect, or a positive affect. And that's why like, uh, the, the data collection takes a long time, because I kind of have to understand what those words mean, and I haven't been able to find medieval Portuguese speakers. <laughs> uh, so the collection is still in progress, but the data set is, is already available. And we're talking about affect in a very broad sense, so some, some dimensions of feeling, emotion, and attitude that can be distinguished in different ways. Um, both of these suffixes have formed words in these three categories of uh, three affect categories. 
So we have neg negative, neutral, and positive words for, for both suffixes. Um, okay, but in contemporary Portuguese, uh, it seems that EC is mostly associated with negative connotations uh, right now. There's this uh, survey I did like many years ago uh, that, so yeah, looking at new formations, uh, uh, so in this, this corpus of almost 5 million tokens, I found 37 compact legomena in EC, meaning like words that appear only once in a corpus, which is a good proxy for new words. And all of them had negative affect, whereas uh, only 4 of 10 words in ESA had negative affect. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the resulting affect of, a, of an ESA word depends a lot on the base of the word. Whereas for EC, it doesn't. So EC can turn words that are neutral or positive into negative words. Now it's okay. And the question is, how did that happen? Um, so here I have uh, the affect of EC by period in the, in the corpus. And we can see that there was a tendency of increase, a slow one, that really picked up in the 1800s, right? This seems to be a uh, very significant trend. Uh, okay, and looking at ESA, so I have like, for ESA I have a, lot, a more limited uh, uh, set of data from only until the 1400s. And we seem to see like maybe uh, an increase in the, in the proportion of positive or neutral, neutral affect words, but I still need more data, so yeah. Okay, so now how did this change? How did this start it, right? Uh, what motivated this uh, easy to, to have this more marked foundation? Um, and I think this uh, uh, came about through the inter by the interaction of between mutually reinforcing conversational inferences. Um, yeah, like thinking about the division of pragmatic labor that uh, like Karl discusses in the game four, Larry discusses. Uh, okay. Um, so the idea is that. Well, since there was already a well-established form in ESA, uh, the use of EC uh, might have triggered, like in many cases, the, the expectation of a marked meaning. So, in some cases, like speakers have, uh, have might have, okay, so this person is using ESA, it's not the more well-established uh, ESA, that might be, that might, the speaker might have a reason for that, so by a relevant, relevance inference, I will assume that there's a there's already a mark there's a mark meaning for that use. Okay. As a result of that, uh, the use of isn't also tended over time to be associated with the unmarked case. Okay. Uh, okay, so this leads to, to a situation that is very similar to the one uh, we discussed, for instance, uh, in which the accretion of examples of easy words with a majority connotation. Uh, led over time to the conventional, conventionalization of this connotation. And importantly, not only easy words, uh, old words, or the phonic sequence easy uh, became associated with this connotation, but the suffix itself. Okay. Uh, since nowadays, it doesn't matter which, what phase you choose, if you use the suffix easy, the connotation is most likely going to be very negative. This is another reason why suffixes as functions from words to words need an independent representation in the system. Uh, yeah, okay. So where we are now, I'm going to the collection of this in ESA, and I am in the final steps of the computational implementation of this model, which will allow us to simulate computation in morphology and in other domains across generations of virtual agents. So right now I already have like a model that can learn uh, exemplars and Similar rules from an, from an initial lexicon and evolve over time by uh, producing new forms or by perceiving forms from other virtual agents. And hopefully, we, we, with that, we will be able to model, uh, maybe do some like cross linguistic modeling by seeing how, how the, the model evolves based on different initial, initial situations, right? Okay. 